Welcome once again. In this session, we are reading John chapter 7, verses 1 through 24. And we're going to be fact-checking the church here on three different issues. You don't want to miss this. John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee. For he wouldn't walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, that would be the Feast of Tabernacles, or in Hebrew would be Sukkot, was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, remember, this is his brothers speaking, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see your works which you do. For no one does anything in secret who seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, reveal yourself to the world." For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Now you need to understand here, his brothers is almost like testing him here. It's almost like they were almost being sarcastic. They're like, you know, Yeshua, you want to be known openly, right? Like you want to be, uh, you're a public figure here. Why are you doing these things secretly? Go into Judea right now and do the works that you do in Galilee. Do it in Judea so that they all may see, okay? So they were testing him here. Because they didn't believe in him either. Okay. Now, this also brings up another point because a lot of people today say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And what they mean is, oh, yeah, I know that he lived. I, I believe in, you know, the, the Jesus who lived and was born of a virgin, you know, died on a cross. But that is not what it means here to believe in him. A lot of people would say, I believe in Jesus. It's like, oh yeah, I know he's real. He's real in my life. That's not what it means to believe in him, to to experience Jesus and have Jesus real in your life is what the brothers of Jesus had here. Okay, you need to understand this. The brothers of Jesus in this context, they saw him face to face. They knew he existed. They experienced him. They knew he worked miracles. Otherwise, they wouldn't say, hey, you know, work the miracles, the same miracles that you do here, work it in Judea, okay? So to believe in Jesus doesn't mean that you believe that he exists, doesn't mean that you have an experience with him. It means something a whole lot more deeper than that, okay? Because his disciples here, they saw him face to face. They spoke with him. They had communication with him. You know, they had an experience with Jesus, but it says here they didn't believe in him. Now, I want to make it very clear here that the word believe, especially when it comes to John chapter, you know, here's John chapter 7, but you know, John chapter 3, verse 16, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. The word believe here means to trust yourself, trust your life with him, to throw yourself basically on him to completely give yourself over to him, to trust him with all of your might, to trust him with all of your soul. That means taking every word that he says very seriously. That means taking him seriously. That means doing what he says. And by by the way, may I add, that means doing what he does, okay? Remember, Jesus is a rabbi. He had his disciples. He had his students. Now, a rabbi is an example. You know, a rabbi is a teacher that teaches not only by word, but teaches by deed so that we can take his example. Jesus is our example. Okay. So to believe in him doesn't mean you just have an experience with him. Just because, you know, believe in him doesn't mean that you just pray and talk to him you know, or, you know, believe that he works miracles. His brothers knew all this, but yet it says they didn't believe in him because believing according to the scriptures means a whole lot more than just mental acknowledgement or just seeing it with your eyes, just having experience with him, just talking with him, praying, all this kind of stuff. It means something much deeper. It means taking him seriously on every level. It means trusting him more than anything else in your life. Okay, it means just completely dedicating yourself to Jesus. That means walking away from the worldly system. That means walking away from worldliness and walking straight into the arms and into the ways, into the teachings, into the commands of 
the Lord. Okay? That's believing in him. Jesus therefore said to him, my time has not yet come, but your time is already. In other words, okay, so his brothers were saying basically, reveal yourself to the world. Let everybody know that you're a king. Let everybody know that you're Lord. Let everybody know that, uh, uh, you know, that you work miracles and that you are here to uh, rule and reign, reign over us, okay? Uh, Jesus was saying, no, wait a second. You don't understand. It's not my time yet to be revealed in this way. It's not time for me to be revealed as, you know, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's not time yet for me to, you know, to take the throne, so to speak, in an earthly sense. Now, you got to realize the book of Revelation is all about the revelation of Jesus to the world. Okay? That's when Jesus comes back and reveals himself as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, as the Lord, you know, Almighty, okay? That is when he reveals himself. Okay? So it's like Joseph in the book of Genesis. If, the, if you know, some of you may be familiar with the story of Joseph with his brothers. You know, his brothers took Joseph and threw him in a pit, left him for dead, so to speak. Um, he was sold off to the Egyptians. The Egyptians uh, took him to Egypt. And um, basically, more or less, he climbed the uh, corporate ladder, so to speak, or more or less, more or less the uh, political ladder right to the top. He was right next to Pharaoh, and he was basically more or less Pharaoh in the land, okay? And Pharaoh took a, you know, kind of let him basically sit on his throne, more or less, okay? And so uh, the brothers of jo Joseph came to, to Egypt because there was a great famine in the land and Egypt was the only place that had food because of Joseph's wisdom, by the way. And uh, time and time again, the brothers came before Joseph and they didn't even know who they were speaking to. They didn't know that they were speaking to their brother. They thought their brother was dead. They thought their brother was dead. And then after a certain amount of time, Joseph couldn't take it no more. He decided, he decided to have a revelation, okay? He decided to reveal himself to his brothers, and so he did. He took his brothers aside, and he pulled off his garb, so to speak. He pulled off his mask, so to speak. He, he showed himself for who he really was, and his brothers were just absolutely shocked. We thought you were dead. You know, and this is what's going to happen uh, that we read about in the book of Revelation. Jesus is going to pull aside his brothers, okay, the Jewish people, and he's going to pull off the mask, so to speak, and he's going to he's going to reveal himself as the Lord to whom the Jewish people goes to for their sust sustenance. Okay, the Jewish people think they're going to the Lord. They don't know they're going to their own brother. So the book of Revelation is all about the revealing of Jesus. And Jesus is basically saying here in this passage, it's not my time to reveal myself like this. It, you know, it, it's not my time yet. You know, he said, but your time is already. In other words, you think that I should now. I mean, to you, the time is uh, right, but it's not right. Okay. The time's not right for this. Now, let's read John chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus said, the world can't hate you, but it hates me. It hates me. Notice that. Because, good thing he tells us why, because I testify about it that its works are evil. Let me say this again, okay? Jesus said that the world hates him. Hates him. Because he testifies that its works are evil. This is fact check number one. Jesus is not this European be it, or Italian or any other kind of European guy going around showing the peace sign with the joint hanging out of his mouth, hugging trees and just hugging everybody and just saying, you know, oh, I love you all. That's not the way it happened. That's not the true Jesus. That a figment of your imagination. But it's not the true, true Jesus of the Bible. That's not the true Jesus of the scriptures. 
the true Jesus, I mean the real Jesus, the real deal, he preached against the sin of the world. You might say, oh, oh, I don't know about that. Oh, the scriptures are right here. We just read it. John chapter 7, verse 7. The world hates me, hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. So Jesus was like these preachers that stand out on the corner calling out, you sinners, you are a whole bunch of sinners. What you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is evil. And you need to repent. Jesus was saying that. He said, I don't come to call the righteous. You know, these people over here, they're righteous. I don't, I don't come for them. I don't come for everybody. I don't, I don't come for the righteous. They don't need me. I come for the sinners, not just to let them feel comfortable in their sin like so many churches do today, but I come to call them to repentance. That means out of their sin. That means you are a sinner now. You should repent of your sin and become righteous. You need to change your status. You need to change your lifestyle. You need to change your spiritual makeup. You need to change. You need to have a a spiritual makeover, okay? You need to be completely new. Let the old die, let the new come, so that all of the old is gone and the new has come, as the scripture says, that we are a new creation in Messiah. A new creation. That's what Jesus wants, okay? So fact check number one is, preach against Sin. So many churches today, you go to church and it's just all about just receiving this nice little, you know, message that everybody feels blessed about. This self-help, you know, kind of message or either that or just some nice little religious kind of message that everybody's like, oh, that's a wonderful sermon, pastor. And like, you know, hours later, they forget all about it. To be telling you the truth. Jesus testified against the sin of the people that he preached to. That's why he said they hate me, okay? They hate me. Now, you think about it today. If he came back in the flesh today and he was preaching against the sin of the world today, they would say he's the hater, right? They would say, oh, it's he's the one that's hateful. But the truth is these hypocrites are the ones that are hateful. They're the ones that are hateful of the holy. They're the ones that are hateful of the true and the just and the, the things of Scripture, the things of God, what the Scripture actually says. They are part of the world system. They hate what is holy. And then they call that which is holy hateful. Big hypocrites. Verse 8, you go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast because my time is not yet fulfilled. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but as it were in secret. The Jews therefore sought him at the feast and said, where is he? There was much murmuring among the multitudes concerning him. Remember, they were, they were about to kill him, you know, they wanted to kill him. <laughs> you know, it reminds me, there's a, a preacher that said that, um, you know, if if Jesus preached the way a lot of preachers preach today, he would never have been crucified. And some said, he is a good man. And others said, not so. He leads the multitude astray. Yet no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So, you know, some of, the, some of these people that like Jesus, but they wouldn't say anything openly about it because they were afraid of the Jews. But when it was now the middle of the feast... Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never been educated? There's two things right here. Okay, number one, Jesus observed the feast. Okay, Jesus observed the feast. Remember, he's a Jew. Okay, and not only is he a Jew, he obeys the Bible. It's not just Jewish holidays, you need to understand. It's Bible holidays. There are so many Christians today, they celebrate every other holiday, but Bible holidays. 
They celebrate every other holiday except for the holidays that God introduced and instituted. Why is that? As Christians, you're supposed to be following Christ. You're supposed to be like Jesus, or at least wanting to be like Jesus, or at least trying to be like Jesus to the best of your ability. Jesus observed the feasts. Okay? He observed more than just this. We know he observed the Passover. We know he even observed feasts that are not so-called commanded in the Bible, such as the Feast of, of Hanukkah. That's the Feast of Dedication, according to the Bible. Okay? Jesus observed these feasts. Jesus observed these holidays. Why don't these Christians observe them? You know, why? And another little tidbit here you need to understand is a lot of people would say that, you know, uh, you got somebody who just recently got born again. You know, they've had a wonderful experience with God. They are brand new in Christ. They have repented of their sins. They're out there. They are just so excited about Jesus. They're just so excited about, about preaching to other people, about getting other people out of sin, you know. And, and so people would say, well, what Bible school did you go to? Or what, what degrees do you have behind your name? Like, you're not educated. You need to get educated about this stuff before you start preaching about it. Hey, if you're born again, if you are truly born anew, if you are full of the righteousness of God, and it shows, okay, your sin is gone. Your sin is gone, I said. As, it said, as, as Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 6, how can you, being dead to sin, sin anymore. How can you live in sin any longer if you're dead to sin? You are dead to sin if you are truly in Christ, if you are truly in the Messiah. So if you are in that spiritual position, you know, hallelujah, if you are, um, you know, preach, preach, yes. Preach against sin. Preach righteousness. Do whatever needs to be done. Uh, to to root sin out of people's lives. Don't let people say, "Well, we're, aren't you? You're not educated. You need to go to Bible school and get a little. You got too much zeal and not enough knowledge." Listen, this is what they said to to Jesus. Okay, let's look at this again. Verse fifteen: The Jews therefore marvelled, saying, "How does this man know letters, having never been educated?" No, they're speaking against Jesus here. They're speaking against Jesus. Jesus therefore answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Once again, Jesus here confirms. He's not here to do anything new. He's not here to start a new religion. He's not here to start a new, you know, to start Christianity. As far as I'm concerned, Christianity started with Adam and Eve, or at least Abel, okay? Jesus wasn't, uh, Jesus didn't start Christianity. Christianity is the religion of believing in Christ. Believing in Christ. Christ in the Greek means Messiah. That's what, that's what Christianity is. Christianity is believing that Yeshua is the Messiah. When, when God preached to, to Adam and Eve saying, your seed will bruise the serpent's head, he was preaching about Messiah. Adam and Eve knew it. He was preaching about the coming Messiah, Yeshua. Adam and Eve knew it. They didn't say, what are you talking about, Lord? No, they knew exactly what God was talking about. That was the first Christian message, really. Or at least that was one of the first Christian messages. I mean, my point is that Christianity started right from the very beginning, not with Jesus. Jesus said over and over again, I'm not doing my own thing. I'm not even speaking my own words. It's the words of the Father, which is the eternal word, which, is the, which are the words that are forever settled in heaven from before the beginning of creation. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If, if anyone desires to do his will, he will know about the teaching, whether it is from God or if I am speaking from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. 
I want to emphasize this again, okay? Because there are a lot of people out there that believe that Jesus is just one of the ways, one of the prophets of God, or one of the leaders of one of the world's religions that he came and he kind of started his own religion. He started a new religion. Not at all. That's not what Jesus said. Never even close to it. In fact, he said the opposite. I'm not here to do anything new. I'm not here to abolish anything. I'm not here to say anything new. Everything I even say. Everything I say is from everlasting to everlasting. It's from, it's from my father. It's, it's not mine. It's from God. The same God that is the God of Moses. The same words that were spoken to Moses is the same words that I'm speaking to you. Maybe in different shapes. Maybe in just a different way. Remember, Jesus, he didn't abolish law. He drove it deeper. You have heard it said, you should not, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, he drove it deeper. Verse 19, didn't Moses give you the law and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Wow. I think that he would say this to a lot of people today, especially Christians. Especially Christians, but also a lot of the Jewish people as well. Didn't Moses give you the law? You've got the Bible there. You've got the Torah there. Didn't Moses give you the law? But none of you keep the law. None of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The multitude answered, you have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Now, once again, if you preach the way Jesus preached, you will not only be hated, but you will be called demon-possessed. It's just, that's just logic, okay? If you're like him, you will get treated like him as well. He was hated. He was called demon-possessed. Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel because of it. Moses has given you circumcision, not that it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a boy. If a boy receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely healthy on the Sabbath? Don't judge according to appearance but judge righteous judgment. And this is another fact check for the church. A lot of people in the church say, oh, it's not for me to judge. I'm not God that I should, oh no, I shouldn't judge. You know, I can't judge. I'm not God. I'll leave the judging to God. You know, God, oh, God will judge. Jesus said here very specifically, very explicitly, very clearly, he said, judge with righteous judgment. He commanded you to judge with righteous judgment. You want to know what I got to say about judge not lest ye be judged? Check out my teaching on Matthew chapter 7. So once again, thanks again for watching and may God bless you as you seek him. Yes, seek him. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness, I say. Hunger and thirst to be right with God to fall in line with his Torah according to how he wants you to fall in line with it. And not according to the interpretation or the misinterpretation, I should say, of man like they did back in Jesus' day when the Jews misinterpreted the Torah, tried to get him on lots of different things, trying to make him out to be a sinner when we all know he wasn't. In the same way, obey the law of God because the law of God is for you to obey. God loves you so much that he gave you his rules, his guidelines, and his instructions to live by. Seek him with all your heart. And if you do, if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Thanks again.